Hey everyone, Noah Zerbe here. This is one of a series of short videos looking at the European Union in international relations. In other videos, we consider the philosophical foundations, the institutional structures, and the decision-making processes in the European Union. In this video, we're going to talk about some of the current issues facing the EU. So let's get started. Arguably one of the primary challenges facing the European Union today is the rise of Euroscepticism and the far right in Europe. Really since its founding, the EU has struggled on the question of how to balance the scope of powers granted to the EU against those reserved for the member states, much in the same way American federalism has shifted back and forth between the relative power of the states and the federal government. Indeed, this tension is common to federal systems and in the context of the EU is often discussed in precisely the language of federalism. However, the expansion of European power has provoked a backlash against the continued process of integration. We see this expressed in a number of ways, including the election of far-right and anti-European parliamentarians, the growth of Eurosceptic parties in the European Parliament, and even the British vote to leave the European Union. And to be clear, the powers of the European Union have expanded pretty dramatically over time. From a pre-EU formation in the 1950s, where powers across all areas were reserved for the national governments, we're now witness to a situation in which the EU increasingly influences, defines, or limits the scope of national authority in key areas of governance, including economic policy, social industrial policy, legal policy, and international relations. Yes, <laughs> this, this directive comes from Brussels, saying that all EEC members must conform to some niggling European word processing standards. That we have to agree to the plans of masses of European word processing committees at the forthcoming European word processing conference in Brussels. Well, say something. <laughs> yes, Minister. Quite so. <laughs> is that all you want to say? Well, Minister, I'm afraid that is the penalty we have to pay for trying to pretend that we're Europeans. Believe me, I fully understand your hostility to Europe. I'm not like you, Humphrey. I'm pro-Europe. I'm just anti-Brussels. <laughs> I sometimes think you're anti-Europe and pro-Brussels. Oh, Minister, I'm neither pro nor anti-anything. I'm merely a humble vessel into which ministers pour the fruits of their deliberations. But it could well be argued that given the absurdity of the whole European idea, that Brussels is in fact doing its best to defend the indefensible and to make the unworkable work. That is simply not true, Humphrey. Huh? I don't understand pompous, but the European idea is our best hope of avoiding narrow national self-interest. That doesn't sound pompous, Minister. Good. Merely inaccurate. <laughs> Listen, humble vessel. Europe is a community of nations dedicated towards one goal. Oh. <laughs> oh may we share the joke, Humphrey? Oh, Minister. <laughs> now, let's look at this objectively. It is a game played for national interests and always was. Why do you suppose we went into it? To strengthen the brotherhood of free Western nations. Oh, really? We went in to screw the French by splitting them off from the Germans. <laughs> Why did the French go into it then? Well, to protect their inefficient farmers from commercial competition. It certainly doesn't apply to the Germans. No, no, they went in to cleanse themselves of genocide and apply for readmission to the human race. <laughs> Never heard such appalling cynicism. Oh, well, at least the small nations didn't go into it for selfish reasons. Really? Luxembourg's in it for the perks. The capital of the EEC, all that foreign money pouring in. Hmm? Very sensible central location. With the administration in Brussels and the parliament in Strasbourg, Minister, it's like having the, the House of Commons in Swindon and the civil service in Kettering. <laughs> if this were true, why would the other nations have been trying to get in? Such as? Well, take the Greeks. Actually, I find it difficult to take the Greeks. <laughs> Open-minded as I am about foreigners, as you both well know. Oh. But what will they want out of it? An olive mountain and a retsina lake. I just don't accept any of this. Oh, Humphrey. I'm so sorry, Minister. I suppose some of your best friends are Greeks. Uh, <laughs> no, very dry. <laughs> The trouble with Brussels is not internationalism, it's too much bureaucracy. But the bureaucracy is a consequence of the internationalism. Why else would there be an English commissioner with a French director general immediately below him and an Italian chef de division reporting to the Frenchman and so on down the line? Oh, I agree. It's like the Tower of Babel. I agree. No, it's even worse. It's like the United Nations. I agree. Uh, then but perhaps, like... perhaps, if I may interject, you are in fact in agreement. No, no we're, we're not. not. <laughs> 
Brussels is a shambles. You know what they say about the average common market official. Mm. He has the organising ability of the Italians, the flexibility of the Germans, and the modesty of the French. <laughs> and that's topped up by the imagination of the Belgians, the generosity of the Dutch, and the intelligence of the Irish. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's all a great big gravy train. What do you they mean? They live on champagne and caviar, <coughs> chauffeur-driven Mercedes, private aeroplanes. Every one of those officials has got his snout in the trough. Most of them have got their two front trotters in as well. Oh, Minister, <laughs> I beg to differ. Brussels is full of busy, hard-working public servants who have to endure a lot of exhausting travel and tedious entertainment. Oh, terribly tedious. Working their way through all that smoked salmon, forcing back all that champagne. <laughs> <laughs> well, in any case, Minister, I think you're blaming the wrong people. A second area of concern focuses on the Eurozone. The Euro is the currency used in most of the European Union. Created in 1991 under the Maastricht Treaty, the euro was launched in 1999 and introduced into commercial use in 2002. Today, it's the official currency of 19 of the 27 EU member states. Officially, to join the eurozone, states must agree to a series of policies intended to ensure currency stability in the region. Specifically, they commit to keeping government deficits at less than 3% of gross domestic product, keeping deficits at less than 60% of GDP, keeping inflation at less than 3% a year, and working towards the convergence of long-term interest rates in the Eurozone. A country failing to meet these targets can be expelled from the Eurozone, though to date none have been. The problems here are twofold. First, currency has both a real and symbolic importance. Look at currencies from around the world. They almost always express a national identity, boasting images of national landmarks, leaders, or important historical figures. Currency thus becomes an important marker of national identity. The euro is purposely designed to be vaguely European in character, but the notes, the paper money, lack any specific national character. The one euro coins are minted nationally and thus have distinguishing features, but these are relatively limited in use. Perhaps more importantly, a country giving up its national currency gives up one of the key tools it has to address macroeconomic crises in the country, namely monetary policy. When an economic crisis hits, countries have a couple of policy options. They can use fiscal policy, basically government spending, to stimulate the economy, or they can use monetary policy, basically using interest rates and manipulating the money supply, to manage the economy. But moving to the Eurozone, countries that have adopted the Euro gain price stability, that is, a stable international currency and low rates of inflation, at the cost of giving up the ability to use monetary policy at the national level to address macroeconomic problems. The European Central Bank, which manages the money supply in the Eurozone, is constrained by treaty to focus on inflation and price stability, and it must do this at the European rather than at the national level. Thus, when an economic crisis hit Greece, for example, the ECB chose to maintain a policy that kept inflation low in Europe, even though such policies arguably made the Greek crisis worse. A third set of contemporary issues center on the question of enlargement of the EU. A number of countries in Eastern Europe have signed ascension agreements indicating their desire to join the Union, but their membership is still outstanding. Turkey has also expressed an interest in joining. But the introduction of new members from Eastern Europe changed the shape of the EU and indeed may have been a contributing factor to Brexit. A rel as the relatively poorer states from Eastern Europe joined the EU, budgets became stretched, and the Schengen Agreement meant that citizens in the relatively poorer states could study and work in the relatively wealthier EU member states. Many did exactly that, in hopes of securing higher paying positions in the West. But increased migration from Eastern Europe to the West was greeted with a rise in anti-immigration sentiment. Polish workers in Great Britain became a focal point in Brexit debates, and regional tensions within the Union increased. And more broadly, the challenge of integrating countries at highly unequal levels of economic development into the Union has proved difficult and created tensions in the process of integration. The Union was essentially forced to choose between continuing to deepen connections between existing member states or expanding the number of members in the Union. It chose the latter over the former, but the outcome of that choice is still evolving. Just as tensions around migration within the Union have increased, so too have tensions around immigration from outside the European Union. The Schengen Agreement, signed in 1985, permits the free movement of people within the European Union, but beginning in 2014, the European Union saw a sharp increase in immigration, first from Libya and later from Syria, of refugees seeking political asylum. 
European Union rules, specifically the Dublin Regulation, require that states where immigrants first arrive are responsible for processing asylum applications. This policy has overwhelmed the ability of recipient states in the Mediterranean, particularly of Greece and Italy, as well as those arriving from the Turkish border, to handle this influx. The arrival of waves of refugees from Libya and Syria into some of the poorest EU member states, like Greece, Romania, and Hungary, has fueled ethnic and racial tensions in those countries and has generated tensions in the Union more broadly. Reactions against immigrants, particularly immigrants from the Middle East, has been strong, leading to an increase in popularity of some of the far-right nationalist parties and further fueling the growth of Euroscepticism. And finally, the series of issues associated with the British referendum to leave the European Union, or Brexit, in 2016 have also cast a cloud over the future of the EU. The process of leaving the European Union was specified in Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty. Once requested by a member state, Article 50 negotiations must be concluded within two years of being requested. Officially, Article 50 was invoked by the United Kingdom on March 29, 2017, and negotiations that resulted in the final exit from Brit of Britain from the European Union concluded on January 1, 2020. In doing so, Britain became the first and so far the only country to leave the Union. But the process of leaving the Union generated considerable tensions both inside the UK and within the EU more broadly. Support for Brexit within the UK was regional, with Scotland strongly favoring remaining in the Union. There was even talk in Scotland of declaring independence and joining the EU as an independent state, but many EU member states were remiss to support Scottish succession for fear of fueling their own independence movements in places like Catalonia, Basque Country, and elsewhere. Further, the situation in Northern Ireland remained unstable, and concerns that a hard border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, which is part of the United Kingdom, would rekindle sectarian violence between Catholics and Protestants that plagued Ireland for the better part of the 20th century. So that concludes our very brief overview of current issues facing the European Union. Be sure to check out the other videos in this series, and thanks for watching. Have a good day. Bye.